Welcome everybody to today's webinar, our Woodland Owner Lunch and Learn series. Uh, today's topic is managing forest to conserve wildlife. I'm going to introduce our presenter here in a second. Uh, just a couple quick uh, logistics. If you have questions for to our presenter today, I ask that you click on the Q&A feature and enter those in at that point. If you something comes up during the webinar uh, and you're having some issues or something, you can uh, type that into the chat window and send it to the panelists and I'll see it there and try to help you. Our presenter today is Dr. Chris Mormon. Uh, Chris is a professor of uh, fisheries and wildlife here in conservation biology at NC State University, and he is a faculty scholar, which is a great honor of our university. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris, to get this started. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to share some of my ideas with the audience. I'm going to start off today by covering some basic principles. It's going to be difficult for me to give uh, specific recipes for every one of the many landowners are, that are in the audience today. So hopefully if I provide these principles, individual landowners can use those to make decisions on their own properties. I always would advise to consult or get assistance from a consultant or a professional biologist when trying to make uh, develop management plans for the property. Um, as Bob mentioned, we hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of today's talk. Um, if there's not enough time for you to ask your question, I am super available. So you can send me an email and maybe we can put my email address in the chat box at the end. And I'm super um, willing to answer questions after this talk if anybody has any. So um, we're going to go through a few basic principles that I always like to share when I'm giving a talk like this. And the first is that no single forest stand can provide quality habitat for all wildlife species. And uh, in that same vein, no single forest stand can provide quality or can provide all of the life history requirements for some wider ranging species. So for example, uh, maybe you want to attract wild turkeys to your property. You have a single stand that may that stand may provide nesting cover, but it may not provide brood cover. So, so what does that mean? That means you neither either uh, very clearly define what you want to do in that stand, what animals you want to attract to that stand, or you need to diversify the forest stand types across your property if you want to maximize wildlife diversity or if you want to provide the life history, the multiple life history requirements for wider ranging species like wild turkey or white-tailed deer. It also means that if you have a very small property, you're going to be limited in what you can do. Um, in a small property, you're only going to be able to provide the habitat for those species on which you focus in that single stand or those few stands. And you may not be able to provide all the life history requirements for wide ranging species like deer and turkey. So you may just want to focus on one aspect of, of those species. No matter what you do, and this is, this is a really critical point, no matter what you do, there are always going to be winners and losers in the wildlife world. So if, if you have focal species, you probably want to make sure that whatever you do is making them the winners. So um, we, want to, we want to think about what animals we want to attract, and we want those management activities to make those those focal animals the winners as we go out and manage. Um, a common question I may get from a, land, uh, from a landowner is what can I plant in my food plot? Um, food plot management does not equal wildlife management in my opinion. It's icing on the cake. Food plots are, especially, are, are certainly critical for concentrating wildlife activity and increasing hunter success, but food plots typically are, are not managed at a scale to make a difference in the number of animals or the quality of individual animals. Instead, they're just icing on the cake. And if a landowner had food plots on, let's say, one half of a percent of their property, and that was the only place they focused their efforts to, to manage for wildlife, they're really selling themselves short. Because that other 99.5% of the property has tremendous potential. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is what you can do on the rest of that property outside the food plot um, to attract wildlife. Another critical point, um, and this is something I've really begun to focus on over the past 10 or so years, is that when we use the word wildlife in a general sense, it's meaningless. Because as, if you remember before, I said for everything you do, there are winners and losers. So if we don't define our specific terms 
then we may not get what our target, we, we may not attract our target species. Um, so if you went out on, on your property and did anything, you inherently are going to be successful. You're gonna be a success and a failure at the same time because you're gonna attract some animals and you're gonna deter others. So choose your focal species. Learn the natural history of those focal species and then craft your management appropriately. So if you want to attract northern bobwhite to your property, your big task is going to be to remove trees, remove overstory trees from, from that property, because that's the key action you're going to take to improve habitat for Bob White. Conversely, if you want to attract oven birds, which are a little songbird that nests in the, in the forest understory in North Carolina and much of the eastern U.S., you want to conserve as many trees as possible because oven birds favor closed canopy mature forest. So these species are very opposite and, you know, you need to focus on what you want so you get those focal species. Our management choices matter. And here I have a, a, a decision tree. Maybe this decision tree is the life of a forest stand rotation. So you can think from beginning to end the cycle of life for this forest stand. And I have a series of decisions we might make through that, through that life of the stand. And at every decision point, we can either say yes or no. So if the first question is the clear cut, or maybe we do some alternative uh, regeneration system like a seed tree. Um, if we do a seed tree, the air, we're gonna go up in that direction. But if we choose a clear cut, let's say we do yes, then the decision is do we protect snags as part of that clear cut? If we say yes, then do we replant? If we say no, we go this way. If we say yes, we go this way. If we're gonna replant, are we gonna use herbicides to control competition? No, yes thin? Are we going to burn? Yes or no? Are we going to thin again? Yes or no? And you can imagine um, uh, over this whole life of this stand with all these decisions, there are numerous, probably uncountable numbers of conditions that could be yielded by these, these variable decisions. And not only do these simple yeses and nos make a difference, but also the size, severity, frequency, and pattern of these decisions. So if we're going to conserve snags, how many snags? How large a diameter snag? If we're gonna replant, or we're gonna replant really dense, or we're gonna replant with wide spacings. If we thin, how much are we gonna thin? Are we gonna do a light thin or a heavy thin? If we burn, are we gonna burn frequently or infrequently? So all these decisions add up to influence the conditions on your property that are gonna um, affect the wildlife that are gonna show up afterwards. So I have these, Bob's gonna kill me, but I added these slides um, last minute just kind of to help direct the flow of the talk. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about plant succession because it's really important when we're trying to manage for wildlife and, and when we're trying to understand what kinds of wildlife might respond to how we manage our forest. So here I have a, a diagram that captures the, the real simple idea of plant succession. So succession is the change in plant community over time after a disturbance. So here we have stage one. This is, this is at the time of disturbance or soon after. And then over time, that plant community is going to succeed. These early stages, stage one and two, are characterized by herbaceous plants. Their herbaceous plants dominate the plant community here. Early on in stage one, they're going to be annuals, which means they live one year. And then after that, they're going to be perennials in stage two, which those are herbaceous plants that live for multiple years. Then we move to stage three and four. We're gonna have a plant community dominated by woody plants. They're gonna typically be shade intolerant, fast growing woody plants. And then if we get to stage five, um, here this has stage six. In, um, in most of our Eastern hardwood forest, we have uh, five stages of succession, but the, the later stages of succession are gonna, gonna be dominated by shade tolerant trees like American beech and sugar maple. So why does this all matter? Well, it matters because animals are closely linked to stages of succession, um, especially birds. Um, if you're trying to manage for morning doves, you, you might know that they feed on, on bare dirt. So they're gonna be really closely linked to stage one. You see here a white-tailed deer in this picture. Um, white-tailed deer are a wide ranging species. So they're gonna be associated with many stages of succession. So they're gonna be harder to pin down. Um, I'll, use, I'll use the term serial stage throughout, and that's the same as stages of succession. So we can call them successional stages or serial stages. So let me go into a little more detail here. 
This is a this is a diagram that's been around for eons, but it, it captures um, the relationships between birds and succession. So you see here, this is the community type, or this is the stage of succession from bare field to grassland to shrubland to shade intolerant or pine forest to less shade um, or, or to more shade tolerant species, oak history, oak hickory, and out here you may even get into beech and, and maple. And you see up here on the top, the different birds are associated with each stage. So grasshopper sparrows are associated with the early stages of succession because they're grassland birds. And then prairie warbler and field sparrow are going to be uh, more associated with shrublands or uh, a mixture of, of herbaceous plants and woody plants. And then we have the species over here on the right that are associated with forest. Uh, many of them are going to be canopy dwelling species. Obviously, if you're a bird that lives in the canopy, you can't occur in early succession because there is no canopy. What about rabbits? If you're, an, if you're a rabbit enthusiast like me, you're gonna really focus on these early uh, stage two and three of succession where you get grass forbs and you get uh, woody plants or, or shrubs, uh, brambles, because this is where rabbits live. If you're managing for, for succession over here, you're not managing well for rabbits. Um, what about gray squirrels? Obviously gray squirrels are canopy dwelling species. They're associated um, a lot with acorns and other hard mass that's, that's connected to um, mature forest or later stages of, of succession. So we're gonna to wanna to manage over here for gray squirrels. If we're managing over here, we're not gonna have many gray squirrels, if any at all. Um, you know, I, I'm just gonna briefly point out that the early succession, the, when we have a plant community dominated by herbaceous plants, and that's grasses and forbs. Uh, many of you may wonder what forbs are. For, many of you may call forbs weeds. Uh, that's things like ragweed, partridge pea, um, mare's tail, any, any of the flowering um, broadleaf non-woody plants. And then you, most of you know what grasses are, I, I would assume. So these early succession plant communities are gonna be dominated by grasses and forbs that provide excellent nesting and brood cover for turkeys and bob white. Um, they're also gonna be very high in forage production, especially when you start to get um, some woody plants mixing in, maybe more than 2000 pounds per acre for white-tailed deer. Um, they're abundant. They have abundant seed and fruit. Um, those seeds are coming from the grasses and forbs. They're also coming from brambles. You have blackberry there, uh, abundant fruit. Pokeweed is going to provide fruit. And then there are seeds in those fruits that are going to attract seed-eating species, songbirds, morning doves, and other wildlife. And then they obviously provide very dense cover near the ground, which is going to be important for uh, deer fawning cover, for turkey brood cover, turkey nesting cover, and northern bobwhite nesting and brooding cover. Um, and just to clarify, northern bobwhite are a, a largely an early succession species associated with stage, primarily stage three of succession where we have a mixture of woody plants and grasses and forbs. So to give you some, just to go through some little more details about plant succession, here's a picture of an old field this obviously is not a picture from North Carolina. It's actually a picture from New Mexico, but we can see these old field communities anywhere, anywhere you go. And this is a, maybe an agricultural field that was abandoned and it's gonna be colonized by grasses and forbs over time. Woody plants will come in, but it may take decades for the woody plants to come in and, and shift this plant community from stage two to stage three of succession. So here we would expect grassland birds, cotton rats, maybe other old, maybe old field mice. We may have, um, maybe have some Northern wild, Bob White or wild turkey brood cover here. We may have uh, deer fawns that are fawning. This is excellent fawning cover for deer. So these are very important plant communities, these early succession communities. As managers, we can actually uh, speed up succession when we plant trees in an old, when, when we go from here and we, we put trees in here, then obviously the woody plants quickly become the dominant component of the plant community. So we shift that stage of succession from stage two to three, and we shift the kinds of animals that will be present there. So here, when we have more woody cover, we're gonna, they're, they're not gonna be any grassland birds here because they won't tolerate a woody component in the plant community. But here we're gonna start to get uh, more shrubland species um, this is still excellent cover for Bob White, but we'll start to get field sparrows and prairie warblers here. Um, still a good nesting cover for wild turkeys and great cover for deer fawns. 
So if we go back to that, um, that graph I showed you before, where we have this successional, um, this gradient of succession here, now we establish trees, we essentially eliminate um, those first two stages of succession by planting our pines. So we can recognize that no grasshopper sparrows are ever gonna be there. We've essentially eliminated habitat for grasshopper sparrows and instead we're gonna move directly to the places where field sparrows and prairie warblers persist. Um, similarly, if we have a mature hardwood forest and we do a clear cut harvest where we cut all of the overstory, we may end up with this um, in a very short amount of time. So these, are, these, are, these may be hardwood seedlings or saplings that came up from seed, but most of the time they're gonna be stump sprouts that came up from these trees are gonna sprout. And then um, there's gonna be really dense, high numbers of, of tree stems per acre here. Um, this is excellent cover for, for rough grouse, but this is not early succession because this plant community is dominated by woody plants. So you remember that graph before, now we took a mature hardwood forest, we clear cut it, um, the stems come back. Actually, it's the same. If these are stump sprouts, these are exactly the same trees as we had originally. They're just the, the um, because the root systems are still intact. These are just the, the sprouts from those same trees. So we've, we've remained within a very similar successional stage. We've just changed the structure. And, um, and quickly those, those sprouts will get back to a, a mature status and we'll get back to a very similar wildlife community to what we had before we did the clear cut harvest. So I've already hinted at vegetation structure. So now I'm gonna talk a good, bit. so we've talked about plant succession. Now I'm gonna talk about vegetation structure. Um, I, I believe that a manipulation of vegetation structure through management is where we can make the biggest difference as managers in, in terms of the quality of habitat for fo focal wildlife species. So um, disturbance history obviously affects structure. If we have thinned and burned a forest stand, which I'll talk about in a bit, it's gonna have different structure than if we have not. Serial stage affects structure. Now, I, I told you all that um, serial stage or successional stage is defined by plant composition, whether they're herbaceous plants or woody plants. But um, obviously, if you have only herbaceous plants, it's gonna have much different structure than if you have a lot of woody plants. And the key point here is that as managers, we can manipulate this. So plant structure is directly related to management. And, I, and I'm gonna focus on this a good bit for the, for the rest of the talk. So here's a, a photo that I took in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And you can see here, there's a light, gra light gap on the left that was created by a timber harvest. Um, these were group selection openings that were created um, by a logger. And there's a lot of light here. So because there's a lot of light, you see a tremendous amount of structure in the understory, um, primarily woody sprouts. So the animals that are associated with this dense woody understory are gonna be attracted to this area. Over here on the right, you see no light because the canopy was not removed. So there's no structure, there's no vegetation near the ground. There's no structure there. So animals that require structure near the ground will not be present over here. So we can, we can measure um, structure, um, or we can quantify structure using a term called vertical structure. And, and within a given stand, um, the complexity or the amount of vertical structure is associated with how many layers of the forest are present. So the different layers, I, I, I classify the layers, you can simply say overstory, midstory, or understory, um, and, or we can subdivide understory into the shrub layer and the herbaceous layer. So the herbaceous layer are grasses and forbs, and the shrub layer is either gonna be woody sprouts or it's just gonna be shrubs and brambles. Um, so if all these three layers are present, or all these four layers are present, then we have really high vertical structure or complex vertical structure. If we just have an overstory and nothing beneath it, then I would call that fairly simple structure. So, so again, vertical structure, um, we can measure it by determining how many forest layers there are. And here you can see another cartoon kind of representation of, of vertical structure, the canopy, the midstory, the shrub, and the ground cover or herbaceous layer. Um, this, this concept of vertical structure is really important to birds because birds can fly. So because birds can fly, they segregate themselves out among these different layers. And I'll show you a slide 
that covers this in just a second. But I really want to stress the third bullet here is the understory is so critically important because all the animals we may want to attract to our property other than birds um, are, are essentially relegated to the forest floor just like people are because of gravity. So if we want to attract deer or rabbits, they can't fly or climb trees. So this layer near the ground is going to be critically important to those species. The same for, for Bob White quail because they don't they don't live in trees, they don't fly that very often, they mostly run on the ground. So if you're trying to attract game animals, animals that can be hunted, this understory layer is where you need to really focus a lot of your attention. Now the challenge is that to get an understory layer, there needs to be resources to allow that to happen in many cases. So um, I call this Mr. Sun. So if Mr. Sun's trying to shine down to give light for the understory to develop, but there's a real dense crown, it's not gonna happen. So these different forest layers are gonna compete with each other for light, um, water, and nutrients. So how do we get this understory? Well, we have to actually reduce the canopy to allow light to get in. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, so I mentioned the relationship between vertical structure and birds before. So I just wanted to point out that different species of birds are associated with different layers of the forest. So a pine warbler, lives in pine forest, obviously, but it lives primarily in the canopy of pine forest. Brown-headed nuthatches live in pine forest. They live in the canopy and maybe the, low, the, the upper and lower levels of the canopy. A summer tanager is associated with mixed pine hardwood forest. They tend to live in the mid-story. Um, our, our North Carolina state bird, the Northern Cardinal, lives in the mid-story and in the understory in the woody layer. Eastern towhees are primarily a ground-dwelling species or a species that resides in the shrub layer. And then I've already mentioned oven birds, they live right on the ground, primarily in the leaf litter. So on the left, we have a forest condition that has very simple structure. It lacks any vegetation beneath the canopy. So here we will not have northern cardinals and we will not have eastern towhees. We will have oven birds because they're associated with the leaf litter layer. Over here, we can have all those species because we have all the layers of the forest present, so we have diverse structure to attract a whole wide array of species. Now, again, the challenge of creating this kind of diverse vertical cases, we probably need to take this tree out right here in the middle to allow light to allow us to maintain this understory layer. So here's a picture of um, uh, do, uh, what I would call poor vertical structure. And I, I always tell students, this is where quail go to die. Quail unknowingly uh, walk into these, these forests because they, they feel safe with a forest overstory, but they're not safe because predators can easily pick them off. Um, we got to this place because of prior management, poor prior management, and we can actually fix this condition with management moving forward. And we'll talk about that in a good bit coming up. So how do we correct this kind of condition where there's very poor structure? Um, if we walked into this stand, we're very unlikely to detect any wildlife. Um, maybe a deer or turkey may loaf here, but it's, it's, it's going to be near sterile in terms of wildlife. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about civil culture, or in other words, I'm going to talk about timber harvest strategies that we can use to manipulate structure and obviously we can manipulate cereal stage. So we can manipulate cereal stage. Um, if we have a mature forest and we clear cut it, we've shifted that cereal stage to an earlier cereal stage, especially if there are not a lot of hardwood sprouts coming up. Um, but because we've removed all the overstory, um, the structure is greatly simplified. So any animals that are associated with the canopy or the resources associated with the canopy will be lost. Um, resources, a good example of a resource associated with the canopy are acorns. So acorns come from mature oak trees. If we remove the overstory, there are no longer any mature um, acorns coming from that canopy. So instead, we can use what are called retention harvest or different retention harvest strategies to retain some overstory structure. Um, this is an oak this is a picture of an oak shelterwood harvest. Um, this is still what we call an even age regeneration method. So our goal is to regenerate trees here, but you can see a, a fairly large number of overstory trees are retained. So the structure associated with the overstory was retained um, along with the resources there. So we're gonna continue to get acorns from that overstory. Um, 
but we're gonna, we have, now we have a ton of light reaching the ground. So we can expect a lot of structure to develop near the ground layer and all the wildlife associated with that ground level structure to come in. Um, in many cases, if, if you know much about civil culture, um, for maybe three to five years after an oak shelter would harvest, a manager may come in and remove the overstory, but we can retain the overstory um, using a strategy called a retention um, shelter wood harvest or an irregular shelter wood harvest to keep um, those multiple layers present. Um, another timber harvest strategy is called a pre-commercial thin, often referred to as PCT. Um, this is an, an important strategy early in a stand rotation to allow sunlight to reach the forest floor and to improve forest structure. So you can see up here before a pre-commercial thin, we have a lot of tree stems. We have very dense regeneration in a stand. There's no light reaching the ground. If you pushed into this stand and walked in about 10 or 20 feet, you'll see essentially leaf litter and, and no structure in the understory. And it'll be, it'll be very quiet because there'll be almost no wildlife present. So we need to get light to the forest understory. So we do a pre-commercial thin where we remove a large number of the comp competing stems to allow light. This also improves the growth of the retaining stems and in improves our structure. Now this is called pre-commercial because this management activity is conducted before any of the trees have commercial value. So this action comes at the cost, at a cost to the landowner, um, though there are some cost share programs to help um, share that cost. And you can work with your your consultant or your biologist to learn about some of those cost share programs. Um, then we, the trees are of a commercial size, so the trees can be sold for some income. We can do a commercial thin. So a commercial thin is performed to in, increase, uh, to improve the conditions for our crop trees. So here we've done a commercial thin in this short leaf pine stand, and we would expect our short leaf trees to grow more rapidly because now they have more light and resources. But from a wildlife standpoint, the critical thing is we've allowed sunlight to penetrate through the canopy and we're gonna to start to see uh, an understory response here. So we're gonna get be better vertical structure. So that understory is gonna provide um, bedding cover for deer, forage for deer, uh, places for shrub nesting songbirds to occur, turkey nesting cover, um, and so on and so forth. Um, here, this is called an area thinning because the trees were removed uh, from across the stand. You can see the skid trail here, but the trees were removed across the entire stand, probably targeting a specific basal area. Whereas here's a picture from the coastal plain of North Carolina. This is a row thin where the, the trees were planted in rows as part of a plantation. And then later on, manager, a manager or a logger will come in and just remove every third or fifth row. We get the same benefits because we get light to the understory and we get improved structure. So um, you may be asking, well, how should I thin? How much should I thin? It depends on your focal species. Um, so it's hard for me to give very specific recommendations, but in general, if we're managing for wildlife, we wanna get it, we wanna have at least 30% 30, 30 of the ground receiving sunlight. So that means we want less than 70% canopy cover. If we want less than 70% canopy cover, for wildlife, we're gonna to need to thin even more than that because the second you walk away from a thinning, the, the crowns are gonna expand and start to take up um, some of the sunlight. So we wanna to thin to less than 70 or 80 square feet per acre of basal area. Um, if you don't know what basal area is, it's just a measure of the cross-sectional areas of all the trees on an acre. And it's really equivalent to how much, how dense the stems are and how much light is getting through the canopy although there are some complexities associated with it. When managing pine stands, if we're generally managing for wildlife, though, again, you need to know your focal species to make very specific prescriptions. For example, a northern bobwhite, we typically uh, uh, target much lower basal areas because again, bobwhite are associated with dense shrub, shrubby understory. So typically less than 50, 50 square feet per acre. Um, one thing, uh, one, one rule of thumb we might use for northern Bob White is know what your site index is. So site index is the height of the trees at, at a base age of 50 years old. So if your site index is 75, we would subtract 25 as a maximum basal area we want for quail. So site index minus 25 is a good maximum basal area for quail. So again, much lower basal areas uh, for quail than we would typically do to manage for timber. <clears throat> 
Um, so what, what's the specific benefits of thinning um, the vegetation on wildlife? It creates an open, more diverse structure because of the, the light that's able to penetrate through the canopy. It promotes understory development. Um, specific benefits would be increased understory forage for deer, which I've mentioned. Uh, more fruit production because you're going to get more understory woody plants producing fruit. They have more light on them, so they're going to produce more fruit. Um, the understory provides excellent turkey nesting and, and deer fawn hiding cover. And we can also attract a number of pine woodland birds like this brown-headed nuthatch or a red-headed woodpecker or eastern wood peewees. But um, after we thin and we allow all that light to get to the understory, and if there's a woody component there, especially um, we get regeneration or sprouting of red maples um, or sweet gums, we're going to rapidly have a midstory. And that midstory is going to begin competing for sunlight and it's going to shade out the understory. So we're going to lose that understory component that's so critical. So here we can actually begin to implement prescribed fire. So we can use frequent low intensity prescribed burn to keep the structure near the ground, top killing hardwood sprouts and over time promoting grasses and forbs. So here is a picture of a pine woodland that's being maintained with frequent fire and there's very sparse midstory. Here's a picture of a, an oak woodland in East Tennessee and it's being managed with frequent fire to minimize the midstory and maintain that understory of grasses and forbs, brambles, blackberries, and shrubs. It's critical that we link these two practices of thinning and burning. So on the left, I mean, this is not the greatest picture, but let's imagine that there's really dense canopy cover here and we're using prescribed burning in the understory. We would not expect much of a response um, because there's too little light. So instead, we're just burning leaf litter um, time after time and ag again, and we're, we're not going to get much of an understory response. Um, one thing we do with that frequent fire in a closed canopy forest is we will, we will eliminate midstory. So we will change the structure some, which can benefit um, some species that provides excellent loafing cover for wild turkeys. Um, on the right, we may have a lot of light because we have an open stand, an open pine stand that has been thinned. Um, but because there's so much litter without prescribed burning, we're not gonna get um, germination of grasses and forbs. Our grasses and forbs, our herbaceous plants, typically require bare mineral soil to germinate. So here we use fire to consume the leaf litter um, and to promote a, a germination site for those grasses and forbs so we get that structural response that we want. Um, so just another point here is that if we used if we did a, a thinning in our pine stand, we've got light, we have a midstory, we may come in and use herbicides to control that midstory, um, which is fine. The problem is the herbicides do not consume that litter, so they do not pre prepare the bare mineral soil to get herbaceous plants. So we need fire. Um, uh, we know that um, from research and experiences that most of our animals in the southeastern United States are adapted to frequent fire. And we know that if we want to maintain uh, wildlife diversity on a large scale, uh, especially attracting less common species like this gopher tortoise, we need fire. And many of the wildlife in the southeastern United States that are declining, threatened or rare are associated with fire. Um, that would include red cockaded woodpecker, indigo snake, flatwood salamander, gopher tortoise, um, northern bob white, and so on and so forth. So lots of species are associated with fire. Um, the specific benefits of fire um, is that we can use fire to change the structure of the forest. You already, you already remember that I talked about minimizing midstory through fire. Um, we can shift the composition of a plant community, especially the understory plant community from less woody plants to more herbaceous plants. Um, here is a burned hardwood stand from East Tennessee. And you can see that we have a lot of legumes in the understory. They're responding to the presence of fire. Um, this is beggar lice or desmodium. Um, which is high in nutritional value as a white-tailed deer forage. It also produces seeds for quail and other songbirds. Um, um, through fire, we can increase available browse nutrition. Uh, new growth is more palatable. We also get a pulse of nutrition the, for the month after fire, and I'll show you a graph about that in a second. And we also get an increase in fruit production for two to five years after fire. So he here's a graph from some research we did at Fort Bragg Military Installation in North Carolina. And what we did was we looked at the plant nutrition um, over time following prescribed burns 
um, during different seasons. And, and this is kind of a complex graph, but I want, I want a simple message here, is that um, this, um, this red line represents the time of burning, and this is a summer burn, so it's an early growing season burn. And then you see um, a spike in crude protein content in the forage. And crude protein is a measure of the amount of nitrogen. And nitrogen is a very important um, nutrient for white-tailed deer, um, for, for antler growth and bone and tissue development. So we see a, a spike in that um, crude protein content for the month after fire, maybe two months after fire, but when we get to August, it's nearly back to the kind of the status quo for all the other treatments here. Um, here's a spike. Um, from our spring burn that occurred in April, and you see a very similar spike in May, a month for the month or two after the fire. And then these other burns are a burn during the dormant season, the previous dormant season, and then a burn during the previous summer. And you can see that after a month or two, all these treatments are running at a fairly similar level of crude protein in the plants that, are, that occur in the understory there. So we do get a spike in nutrition, but it's fairly short-lived. So, um, a point I like to make about fire is that once is not enough. Um, if we burn our woods only one time, we have very minimal effects on the vegetation. And if there are any effects, they're very short lived. So if you wanna maintain a condition through fire, you need repeated and frequent fires to shift structure and to shift vegetation composition. Typically we, the shift in structure would be minimizing mid-story. The shift in composition will be promoting more grasses and forbs. Um, frequency and intensity matter, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some graphs here. So if we burn very frequently, we're going to get a, a very different structure and composition than we burn than if we burn less frequently. If we burn intense, uh, we may kill some overstory trees, whereas if we have very low intensity burn, we wouldn't expect to kill the overstory. Um, so here's a stand that has been burned frequently with low intensity fire. Um, you can see there's sparse midstory but dense understory of woody sprouts and grasses and forbs. Um, here's a stand that was burned very intensively. One time, or yeah, one time here, we killed some of the canopy, tremendous amount of light getting to the ground, so we have a lot of response in the understory. Um, uh, over time, this understory will become midstory and canopy, so if we want to maintain this structure, we have to continually burn to keep the structure near the ground. Um, I would never recommend this type of strategy on, on, a, on a, this is on public lands, but I would not recommend this on private lands. So instead of killing, killing the canopy with fire, we can actually come in, do a commercial timber harvest, remove the canopy through commercial timber harvest, and then start implementing fire and get a very similar structure. Uh, I mentioned that um, burning can uh, affect fruit. So if we do frequent burning, let's say every one to two years, we're gonna over time promote more grasses and forbs and less woody understory, but we can eliminate uh, understory fruit production from blueberries, blackberries, um, uh, gallberries, and other plants like that. Uh, because what we know from research, and this is a graph from Fort Bragg, is that the same year as fire and the year after fire, those woody plants do not produce fruits and they typically do not start producing fruits until two years or more after fire. So if we're on a two year burn rotation, we're gonna be burning right here between one and two years post fire to stay on that two year rotation. So we're never gonna have any fruit. Um, whereas if we burn on a three year rotation, a third of our uh, forest stands would have fruit. And if we burn on longer rotations, more would have fruit. Uh, this is not a real concern unless you're burning large acreages um, very frequently. If you're burning some small acreages frequently, certainly you're gonna get a different set of benefits, notably more grasses and forbs. So just think about the scale of your management when you're, when you're thinking about this. And we do know that burning increases fruit two to three years, two to three, four, five years after fire relative to unburned stands. Um, less frequent fires are gonna promote more woody understory and they may allow some midstory to persist, persist as you can see in this photo here. Um, we can use herbicides to complement fire. Um, so as I mentioned before, we can use herbicides to remove, remove the hardwood midstory, especially in degraded fire suppressed stands. It limits the, the need for more intense fires to try to create those larger diameter stems. Um, but remember herbicides alone uh, do not clear the leaf litter and prepare the bare mineral soil. So we can combine herbicides to remove that midstory and then add the fire to remove the litter layer to prepare the, 
bare mineral soil and then we get an incredible herbaceous response. So we may go from a stand like this where we have a dense midstory. We certainly would not want to put fire in here with all these ladder fuels. We can use herbicides to remove the midstory. And then we, we could potentially get to a stand like this. Um, that's kind of uh, maybe a little bit of magic there, but you get the idea. Now you see in this stand, there's very little woody cover in the understory. So you need to know your focal species. This condition is great for some species, but the lack of woody understory or the lack of woody component in this understory, this stand could be detrimental to other species like Northern Bob White, which really need that woody component. So um, one of the final things I wanna talk about, uh, I wanted to mention the concept of edge um, because this is a phenomenon that I often hear described um, in the wildlife management literature to create more edge to attract wildlife. We call this the positive edge effect. And um, so the question is, I'm asking is edge important? Um, I'm gonna suggest based on maybe, maybe my own new way of thinking is that edge, the importance of edge is only an artifact of what humans have done to the landscape. So we, we are managing closed canopy forest stands like you see here. There's very little structure in the understory for wildlife. So where are we gonna see animals? Not here, we're gonna see, it, see them at the edge of the forest stand where you get some light coming from an adjacent opening and that's the only place there's structure. Here in this uh, soybean field in Eastern North Carolina, are the, is there any, are there resources for many wildlife? There's no cover out here for most wildlife. So where are we gonna see animals? They're gonna be over here at the forest edge where there's some light in the forest, where there's some structure. Here in this tall fescue pasture, are we gonna see animals out here? Uh, maybe a few, but not many because there's no cover, there's no structure. So where are those animals gonna be relegated? They're gonna be relegated to the forest edge. So this edge effect where animals are common along edges is really an artifact of how we manipulate the landscape. So instead, we can manage a forest stand to be open. We can use prescribed fire. We can promote a, a lush, diverse understory. So in a sense, the entire stand becomes edge. So we can make habitat for our animals everywhere versus just along forest edges. Um, here is a, is a plant community. This is an early successional plant community with grasses and forbs and a few woody plants. Um, this is maintained with frequent disturbance. And here you can see everywhere is edge essentially. So we'll have rabbits and Bob White in turkey nest, in deer fawns, in, across the entire landscape. Um, now, obviously we're not growing trees here, so that could be a, something to consider if you're trying to grow trees for money. Um, if, if edge management is your only option, if you are, you know, if, if income from timber is a, is a primary goal and you can't create forest stands open enough to get much structure in the forest understory, certainly you can uh, manage areas along forest stand edges you can manage them in a food plot. So you can plant food plots uh, to attract wildlife, to increase hunting opportunities, or we can just rotationally disturb this uh, plant community with disking or fire and maintain early succession here. Um, similarly, um, if we have shaded forest roads, these roads don't have light. There's, no, there's got, not gonna be plant structure there. The roads are gonna be wet and rutted. We can do what's called daylighting. We can allow Mr. Sun to get in there and shine down through our forest um, to increase structure there, dry our roads out so we get the dual benefit of, of less wet roads, less wooded, rutted roads, but we also get um, more structure here in the understory because we just removed a few trees, uh, maybe the first uh, 50 feet away from the road to allow light to get in and create some structure along our forest roads. So this is a sort of compromise to, to manage, to improve edges. Um, last thing I'll mention is dead wood. Dead wood is a critical component of forest ecosystems. Dead wood comes in the form of snags. So these are standing dead trees. I typically recommend to retain larger diameter snags, maybe 10 inches in diameter or greater, because that's gonna provide habitat for a, wider range of species, including larger animals like wood ducks and uh, screech owls. Um, if, if you're trying to retain snags as part of a timber harvest, you may set them aside in, in retention areas or away from loggers. You can leave live trees in a timber harvest that will die later, or you can actually kill them by girdling or injecting them. And eventually these standing snags will become down logs. So snags are gonna provide habitat for pileated woodpeckers Wood ducks, these are cavity nesting species. Cavity roosting species like bats, 
um, the list is tremendous in terms of the numbers of animals that will be benefited by snags. Um, we can also retain logs in, in mature forest stands like you see here or as part of, part of logging operations. Here is an experiment I, con I conducted um, with Weyerhaeuser in Eastern North Carolina and we looked at retaining um, piles of logging residue to provide structure, uh, cover, and food for animals here. So the kinds of animals that benefit could be salamanders in, in mature forest. Um, they're going to persist under those logs because it provides food and cover, a cool, moist microclimate. Many bird species like this black and white warbler or rough grouse or wild turkeys may build their nests next to down logs and little critters like mice may travel along logs or they may hide under logs um, um, when available. So in summary, define your focal species. That's a critical thing. You've got to start by defining your focal species. Um, to increase overall, overall wildlife diversity across the landscape or, or across a larger acreage, um, diversify your cereal stages so have young and old forest. Um, increase vertical structure within individual stands using all the tools that I mentioned. Um, use prescribed burning, uh, uh, the appropriate fire regime, the appropriate frequency and intensity to match your focal species. Get light to the forest floor as much as you can using thinning and burning and then retain, retain dead wood as much as possible. Um, there are a tremendous number of resources to help answer some of your questions. Um, they're available at this website um, here through the North Carolina Extension Forestry Group. Um, here's one of the resources that I helped develop using fire to improve wildlife habitat that's available at that link. I also want to um, promote uh, this book by Dr. Craig Harper, Craig Harper at University of Tennessee, uh, A Guide to Wildlife Food Plots and Early Successional Plants. This book is 500 pages and it is packed full of tremendous information um, if you're interested in managing early succession or if you're interested in managing for food plots. And you can purchase that book online directly from him.